This morning, let's turn to uh, 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. And I'll read one verse to you, and then we'll look at several other verses, of course. Um, let's read in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning that we can gather around your word. Lord, we ask you to teach us, encourage us. Whatever the need is in our hearts today, Father, you know. And we ask you to meet that. Um, Lord, we pray that you would just uh, be honored in everything we do here today. Sanctify us through thy truth. Thy word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. That's a familiar story to a lot of us. You know, Elijah on Mount Carmel. And the, and the battle that took place between he and the, and the false prophets, Abel and, and um, Jezebel, I mean, of, of, of Ahab and Jezebel. And it's okay sometimes, you know, when we're trying to make a decision, it's all right that we have two opinions about it, you know. Talk to this person, what do you think you ought to do? You talk to this person, what do you think you should do, you know. At the end of the day, you have to make a decision, but if you... You know, lots of times I've found out if I ask the right people and just, you know, to, you know, give them the correct information, it doesn't take me very long that I can get clarity about what I should do. And then I make a decision. You know, there's some people that go through life and they never can make a decision. It's, eh, so-and-so says do this, so-and-so says this. I don't know which is right or which is wrong, <laughs> you know. But I think that if we ask it, you know, if we talk to the right people, they help us. Now, but when it comes to Spiritual matters, we can't be straddling the fence. We can't have a little bit of everything thrown in. I mean, you know, we can't have these centers where they're, and they're building them to where, especially on college campuses, to where they'll build this faith house or whatever they want to call it, and it's for every religion. There's no religious symbols inside. It's just when you want to come with your little group, here you y'all meet, then y'all leave, and then another group will come in. And the people that are founding those on these campuses is saying, "Hey, we believe everybody, you know, is, is doing the right thing in their own religion. Everything's okay, but it's it's not okay. In the Bible, there are strict lines and separation uh, that we need to make a decision on. We need to make a decision, and that's what Elijah's calling." the nation of Israel, to do. Make a decision. Is God God? Then follow Him. And if He's not, follow Baal. Which is it going to be? And I think, to, you know, in some instances, in many cases today, that happens in, in our churches in America. We come to church, we carry a Bible, and we do Christian things, but when it comes down to really making that distinction, <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm a Christian I'm, I'm, this is how I live. This is who I am. I don't, and you know, for the sake of tolerance, we're supposed to tolerate everybody. I don't tolerate false religion. I don't tolerate lies about the Bible. It's not that I'm mean. It's not that I'm going to attack anybody. But when it comes up, I have to make a statement. I have to make a statement. I just have to. They're making a statement. Why not us? I mean, we're getting ready here in I don't know how many days. We're going to start voting a, a president in. And it's time for Christians to decide. You're gonna, you know, you, you know. I mean, we we got subjects. You going to vote on abortion? You're gonna, you vote for a person that's going to kill babies, and you're going to vote for a person that says marriage have same sex marriages. I mean, it goes against the Bible, and I want to say, whose side you on? You know, is God God or is Baal God? And we are we going to bring our biblical vic convictions into our every area of our life, or is it just for Sunday morning? Is it just when we meet? Or are we going to bring to bear in every area of our life our convictions and our clarity about what God wants us to do? It's funny that this word halt in that, in that verse literally means to limp on, to limp. And so Elijah is saying, why are you guys limping around? Why are we limping around between two opinions? 
It makes us limp. It, it doesn't make us strong. It doesn't make sense. I'm weak. And Elijah, why are you limping? Why are you limping? Between two opinions. Well, hopefully I can show you some things today from this passage that will help us. And maybe we, all of us in here, we're clear on it. That's great. But you know what? I like, I like to do this just to strengthen me. You know? I know this is a familiar passage, but this is absolutely the, 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 the passage that God laid on my heart. And as I studied it, I, I knew, because I've preached on it several times. Who hasn't as a preacher on 1 Kings chapter 18? But as I do it, as I, and it strengthened me more. I go, yes, Lord, thank you for leading me here. For nothing else, it's helped me. Because we need to be called back to that sometimes. And we, sometimes we can drift and we can start saying, well, maybe they're right. And uh, maybe, but when it comes to the Word of God, we've got to make a stand. This is, what we, this is where we are. This is where we stand. Now, we know the story of Elijah. You know, he'd been, he'd said no rain. He had to run for his life. He went by the, the brook and the raven fed him. He went to the widow, you know, and they, they had just enough for one to eat. And he ate and then God just kept replenishing the supply. Healed, healed the, 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 the widow's son. And now he goes and finds Ahab and says, Ahab, I want you to go tell Ahab I'm ready to meet him. I mean, excuse me, Obadiah. Obadiah, I want you to go tell Ahab. Obadiah's kind of scared. He says, you know... What if I go and tell Ahab you're gonna we gotta meet, and you don't show up? I, you know I'm a dead man. Now this is the this is leading up to where we are. Well, sure enough, Obadiah goes and Elijah shows up. If you look in verse 17, and it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Baal, Balaam. That's a, good, that's a good thing to underline there. I have followed, I have not followed the commandments of the Lord, I have followed Balaam. You say, well, what is Balaam? I'll tell you about it in a minute. But for right now, Elijah is saying, hey, this is what's happened. It's not because of me that's preached the word and told you it wasn't going to rain and try to tell you to get your heart right with God. It, you're the ones that trouble America or trouble Israel because of your disobedience to the word of God. And you've chosen to follow something else. Now verse 19, Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400 which eat at Jezebel's table. So we've got 850 false prophets. And he says, I want you to call them. Bring, let's, let's bring them together. Let's go to Carmel. Just Elijah. 850 prophets. And Ahab sent unto all the children, verse 20, of Israel, and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. So all the children of Israel know about this. Everybody's gathering on Mount Carmel. There's going to be a showdown. It's going to be a powerful showdown. I mean, Elijah is going to be calling for fire, and Baal has already been proven false. But, you know, Baal, he was a, a storm god, and he couldn't bring rain over the last three years. At least, you know, we go up here on Mount Carmel, he might be able to send a lightning bolt down to start a fire. Who knows? We'll see. And so when they gathered together, and Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. And they answered him not a word. And we know the rest of the story. They gathered together. They did their offerings. Baal didn't answer. We know, we know he wouldn't. But God answered by fire. I want us to think about verse 21 and try to just hang around that verse for a little while today and see if we can learn some things. See if I, see if we can, see if I can learn something from the Word of God that will encourage me not to halt between two opinions. And to matter of fact, to fear that. Matter of fact, to guard against that with everything in me against this halting, this limping between two opinions. Number one, I want us to think about, first of all, 
when, when Elijah told them, if God be God, follow him. If Baal be God, follow him. Look at that last phrase. And the people answered him not a word. I mean, you know, crickets. It was deadly silent. They didn't say a word. Now, there's another silence in this, too. When, uh, when Baal didn't answer by fire, if you look over at the last part of verse 29, it says um, there, that there was neither voice nor any answer nor any that regarded. Baal was silent. The people were silent. I mean, Elijah's speaking, and, and everybody that can hear and that's around, they didn't say a word. There was silence. What did that mean? And a lot of times, we guys, if anything else, I don't say we ought to go out and be obnoxious. You know? We ought not go out and pick fights. But we definitely ought not be silent. Because what happens is, I think this is showing us that they didn't know where their ultimate allegiance was. Where was our allegiance? Is it to God? Or is it to this group of people? Or is it to this Made up God, Baal, where is our allegiance at? And so when they were silent, it showed. Huh. Now Israel, they grew up under the tradition of Torah. So they weren't going to deny that God existed. But neither were they going to deny that Baal existed. Listen, if we're not careful, guys, we will drift to the point of Israel here to where we don't know ultimately where our allegiance is. Now we might sit in our home and go, man, I'm all about God. But when it comes down to decisions we make in our life and the way we do things in our life, is it show us that God is God in our life? Is our allegiance to Him, is He the one that we can trust? Or do we go, hmm... You know, we go back and forth. So what were they limping between? What were they limping between? Number one, under silence. They were silent because there was two religions. They were two religions. One, Balaam, Baal. What was it? It was a product of man's imagination. They came up with Baal in their own mind. Paul would write about that in Romans chapter 1 and said in their minds they became vain in their imagination and they started worshiping the creature more than the creator and then God turned them over to a reprobate mind and here's Israel they're limping because now in their mind they're thinking hmm maybe when I pastored in Salt Lake I had, there was a person came to our church and they would go around and get baptized in different churches <laughs> I mean, you know, came to our church faithfully at the end but at first they would go to this church they would go to the Mormon they would go here and get baptized and I ask them I go why and they go well maybe they're right <laughs> maybe this one's right and I go that's not the way it works that's not, the, that's not the way. You don't just go over here and go, well, I'm going to go to this church for a while because they're right. I'm going to go to this one a while because they might be right. Now I'm going to believe with this party because they might be right. No, 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 no. That God's not calling us to limp. He's calling us to stand. And we've got to determine, are we following the gods of Baal, which are things that are made up in man's imagination, or are we following divine revelation? Revelation from heaven. The God of heaven is given a revelation. These are the two religions they're dealing with. Either a religion that's made up in the minds of mind, in the minds of men, or a religion that is a revelation from heaven. A revelation about who the true God is, what true worship is, how we're to follow that God. Not one that, hey, we can just in our own minds and in our own imaginations, we can come up with our own religion. Now we won't say that that way. We'll find some kind of writing or we'll come up with a writing of our own and we get our own ideas. You know how that works. We constantly have to fight that, don't we? I got my ideas about things. Well, when the t- when it, before I can share it and stand on it, I got to make sure God's idea is right with mine. 
If it's not, I got to look what his thoughts are. Isaiah 55, he says, My thoughts are not your thoughts. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And so I, when I want to know what's right, I don't go, Well, I think. Now, I might be able to do that on which, what kind of flower to plant. But when it comes to spiritual matters, when it comes to the Word of God, I can't go, well, I don't think God's like that. Well, let's go to the Bible and find out what God's like. Well, I don't think we, I don't think religion ought to really come into the church. I mean, you know, religion ought to really go out and affect politics or, or society. Let's see what God says about that. This is as much a political statement here in this chapter as it is a spiritual statement. We're talking about King Ahab's there. This is the God of their country. This is where their allegiance is. And it's all made up in their mind. And, I mean, you know, I read it to you. God, Elijah told him, said, you're the one that's forsaken the commandments of the Lord and followed Baal. There's no commandments of Baal. Because he's not real. There's only one God. And today, whoever we're following or whoever our allegiance to, basically you make it up as you go. Scary. Whereas I have a solid rock, a foundation when I go to the commandments of God, when I go to the revelation from heaven that God has given me, and multitudes are led today by their thoughts instead of the Word of God. Even sitting in churches... Some people's thinking that, hey, you know what? I know they talk about this repentance and stuff, but I think you can get saved if you just do the right things. That has been the battle of the ages. Man thought, man's thoughts versus God's revelation. It's, it's that way. God will say something. The first, you know, the people that get it, write it down. This is true. Then somewhere down the road. Well, I don't think you ought to do this. You know, I don't think this is right. I mean, we got Halloween coming up. I don't guess there's going to be much trick-or-treating this year. People decorate for that. That's devil worship. (laughs) But everybody's doing it. Okay. God says, I I could take verses and show you the symbolisms of Halloween to how God says, do not do that. But we fall in. You go, come on, preacher. No. It's either God or Baal. It's either God's revelation from heaven or man's ideas. This is where Israel's at. And they're supposedly God's people and they can't give an allegiance to something. They're sitting there. I'm not going to say a word about that. Shouldn't have went there, Elijah. That's none of your business, Elijah. (laughs) Elijah calls them out. There's two religions. And if there's two religions, guess what? There's two masters. There's two masters. Jesus would confront the Pharisees in in John, and we'll get there because we're going through the book of John in Sunday school. In John chapter 8, verse 44, he said, You're of your father, the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. He's a murderer. He's a destroyer. That's what Jesus said about it. So our two masters would be one one that's true, one that brings life, one that brings joy, which comes from a revelation from heaven. And then you have the false one, the liar, the deceiver, the one that will destroy everything you love in your life. You could really break it down to where these people were either following the revelation of God or the superstition of man. uh, Superstition. Because other than a divine revelation, we would be superstitious too. You know, we better not do this. We better not do that. Why? Does God say don't do it or do it? Well, no, but, you know, I just heard (laughs) these religions out here, guys. We've got to be careful. And we can't be sucked in by our society today because God's asking us today. There's no doubt about it. Who's it going to be? Where's your allegiance? Is it to God Or is it to Baal? Is it to man's thoughts and what man can think up about a religion? Or is it from divine revelation? 
Elijah's already pointed it out. Ahab, I'm not the one that's troubling you. You disobeyed God. And America's finding that out right now. We've disobeyed God and God's judging us. God's bringing us back. He's not judging us to destroy us. It's just discipline. And if we'll wake up and go, where's my allegiance at? Where's my allegiance? We have two religions going on here. We have two masters going on. Elijah leaves no room for limping. It's not, I'm going to go over here. And then, well, I'm going to go over here. I think everybody's right. I think everybody's going to go to heaven. No, they're not. And I, I wish they were. I'm not saying that because I, I want it. It's just in the Bible that not everybody is. Are you silent today when it comes to God? Like I say, we don't have to be out on the street obnoxious in people's faces. But just by the way we live our life and the way we, we're not silent when it comes. Somebody steps on our God, we let them know, hey, that God's real, man. The Bible's true. That's not funny. You know, I mean, I've said all kinds of things lately. It, these things are not cool that's going on in America. It's not good. But some people just won't say anything about it. Two religions, two masters, so they're silent. Of course, they're silent. Let's think about, secondly, as we think about this verse, what were the barriers? What was it that held them back? What is it that holds us back from complete allegiance to Christ? Have you ever thought about it? What is it that, man, I go to church and I get fired up and I want to serve God. But boy, by the time I get home and I start doing my stuff, I forget about it the next week and almost don't make it next week. <laughs> you know? Why is that? Why? What's the barriers that stand in our way? Well, the overall, the overall barrier, and we're going to look at some verses on that in, in a minute, but I'm going to name some things first. But overall, it's spiritual warfare is what it is. The devil's trying to blind our mind. Even after we're saved. I know what that verse says. Blind our mind unless they believe the glorious, see the glorious light of the gospel and be saved. But even after we get saved, the devil tries to distract us and draw us away from our commitment to God. It, it might be things like, man, I'll be weird if I start living for God. You won't be weird. You'll be different. But I don't want to be like everybody else anyway. Do you? So that's my number one thing. The number of people, I think, held them back. All Israel, 850 prophets. I think as they looked at that, they stepped back and goes, One Elijah? It's funny, I actually had a couple of people tell me that when I was in Salt Lake City. Pastoring. You know, little church. We got it up, you know, to 100, 125, 150. And that's huge in Salt Lake. It was like the second largest church. And I had more people go, you see that there's so many of us? What makes you think you're right? I actually said that. And they were sincere about it. They weren't trying to smack me in the face. They weren't trying to talk down to me. They just wanted to know, why would you with a little church of 150 go around and tell people truth that's opposite to what Mormons believe and think they're going to listen to you when you got this whole city that's built on and laid out based on Mormons. Or LDS, Latter-day Saints. I go, I just know if this is the truth. You've added another book to this, and the Bible's plain. You add to it, you take away, you take your name out of the book of life. You can't add to it, and you can't take away. And that was my best. I go, you added a book to this. Search the scriptures and see what it says about that. But it did make you think, you know, made you feel very little. Because, but you know what? I can't be swayed by those, the multitude who is choosing the broad way. There's a broad way and there's a narrow way. One way leads to destruction, the other way leads to life. The broad way, destruction. 
The narrow way leads to life. Truth about Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the light. No man goeth unto the Father but by me. There's only one way to be saved. There's only one book to follow. Why, as Elijah would say, why haven't you kept my commandments? And many times, even though these people, we know the Jewish people, man, they were disciplined in the Torah. The first five books of the Bible. They knew what was going on. So they really didn't have any excuse. You know, in America, we don't really study our Bibles much. But it's still not an excuse. If I want to find out how to raise a family, if I want to tr- find out, you know, we got an election coming up. You know, who to, you know how we should determine how we're going to vote? By the Word of God. You know? And then we'd go, it's clear who I need to vote for. Because the lines are drawn today. Their lines are drawn and if we have biblical convictions, there's one way we can't. We can't, I can't and I can't stand up here and, t- and tell you who to, who to vote for and who not to. But I can tell you biblical convictions that abortion is murder. That same-sex marriage is an abomination in God's eyes. <laughs> Do we want to vote for that one? I don't know. I know. I'll stand up and not be silent and go, you know what? According to the Word of God, I can't. I can't. Vote for murder, destruction of the family, the very things that God says in him was life and the life was the light of man, Jesus Christ. When he talks about the institution of marriage and he, he uses it in, 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 uh, in Ephesians as a, as a, as a uh, contrast with the church and Christ as the bride. The church as the bride. The multitude can choose what they want to do and choose their, and say, well, I just think this. And I think what you want to, but you're choosing Baal. We follow the Word of God. And so we're held back, I think, by the multitude. There's a lot of them. Elijah was alone. And then I think fear of man. Just the fear of man. I'm afraid I'll lose friends. I'm afraid if I really spoke my convictions... I'm not going to have any friends. It's a barrier. Eventually, the people we run around with the most is the ones who will influence us the most. And slowly but surely, subtly, we'll be over here and we'll be like Israel, limping. Limping. I don't have allegiance to anything now. It's either... I don't want to hurt them. You know what? I'm not, and I, there's never, I, I can't imagine, I remember a time in my life when I wanted to hurt anybody intentionally. There's been times when I had to stand for the Word of God that had tears in my eyes because I knew it was going to separate some friends. It's so be it. God's calling us to complete commitment to Him. As Joshua would say, choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we serve the Lord. Moses would say, who's on the Lord's side? These men have called Israel out and we, ought, we should be calling people out today and go, you claim to be a Christian. Are you on the Lord's side? That's what Elijah's dealing with. You're God's people. And I'm having to say, well, if God's God, follow Him. If Fear of man. The multitude that surround us. But look at this. Let's go, let's go a little deeper than that. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Because we say, well, there's really nothing to this preacher. You know, I don't really think that. Okay. There's a lot more to it than we think. In Ephesians chapter 6, listen to what Paul says. Beginning in verse 10. He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the schemes, the way he works. Look at verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's a spiritual battle we're fighting. We might look on the outside and go, the multitude, the fear of man, but behind it is evil. Evil. 
Don't we look out in America today and go, there is evil present. There's evil present. We always knew it. But boy, I'm telling you, if you watch any news at all, you know it. It's in political offices. It's on our streets. It's in the mindset of the people. And it was spiritual. It's spiritual battle. The devil's behind that. You don't, you don't, they laughed at Elijah. Fire came. Listen, guys, for long enough, we've ignored preachers. We've ignored the Bible. But now we're confronted with, well, Elijah's calling people too. Why are you limping? It's because there's a multitude out there that's going against God, and we think it's okay. And if we don't want to go against them because we're afraid of them, not afraid of them, but of, but of losing friendships and of losing or whatever. The devil's behind that stuff. Do you know where the battle is? It's in our minds. Remember I told you the last point was it's about the two religions, man's imagination or God's revelation. And now the spiritual battle's coming. You know, we, you know what the Bible tells us? You know, we to raise our children and things to teach them. Why does he do that? Because from the time where, as soon as they can, we should be teaching them the Bible, teaching them what God says, because it restures in their minds. 20 years, fast forward. Whatever's been put in their minds for 20 years, that's how they live. Oh, they're not going to be perfect. We, we worry a lot about behavior. I'm worrying about when I was raising children, getting God's ideas in their minds. You know what we're seeing on the streets today? Young people that have the idea they can destroy, they can kill, they can disrespect, and nobody's going to do anything to them. Rewind. 20 years ago. Well, we'll take our kids to church, but that's it, man. Put them in public school, let the public school brainwash them, teach them these ideas that come out all of a sudden and say, We don't agree with those Christians. We lost a generation. We tried to teach them how to behave without the right ideas in their mind. And we lost it. We got to get back there. We got to pray for revival in our country and realize that this is spiritual battle. This is not just, oh, let them be kids. I let my kids be kids. But I taught, I taught them about God. And I taught them the commandments of God. And their ideas, my kids, they're not out there burning cars today. They, 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 they wouldn't do that. It wouldn't even enter their mind to do that. I taught them to fear and respect authority in the law. Now, well, all the other kids are doing it, preacher. <laughs> okay, as for me and my house. When are we going to quit being silent and quit letting the barriers that are stopping multitudes around us stop us as individual Christians, as, as parents in the homes and teaching our children and filling their minds with God's thoughts instead of the world? Hey, listen, it's happening. I pastor, pastor for 30, over 30 years. I don't know how many times I've heard, well, you know what, preacher, I'm just going to let my kids decide whatever. I go, that never happens. You know that, don't you? Somebody's indoctrinating them. Somebody's teaching them. Somebody's putting false ideas in their mind or true ideas. It's not that. Don't give me that. That's, that's, I'm speechless at that statement. I don't let my kids choose. I've been given a responsibility to teach them what God's passed on to me and I pass on to them. That's my command from God. But a generation didn't believe that. Some did. There's a lot of good kids out there. A lot of good kids. But there's a lot. If they had their choice, shut down churches. Stop them from preaching the Bible. Let's burn cars. Let's get somebody in there who won't tell anybody what to do. Let everybody out of jail. No police. It's a free life, man. Anybody in their right mind. Sane wouldn't say that. And we've been duped. We've been pulled in. And the devil's sitting back laughing at us today. Why? 
and we say everybody else is doing it. Well, Elijah, he didn't really care about that. He said, how long are you going to limp between two opinions? You either be for God. If God's God, let God be God. If He's not, then follow Baal. Follow man's vain imaginations or follow divine revelation. And then the last thing. So we have the silence and some barriers I threw out there. But what was their position in this? The position. What, what, did, this, what did this produce in their life? Because they had the barriers and they gave in to the barriers without believing God, because they were, did not have a true allegiance to God, what's their position now? How are they as individuals? Well, we could read the rest of the story and see that you got these false prophets bouncing around and cutting themselves and trying to get Baal to send fire. And it didn't happen. And we see them over in verse 29. I already read it to you once at the end of it. That they were neither, there was neither voice nor any answer nor any that regarded. Everybody's silent. Let me just say this. If, if, I'm, if I give in to the barriers, if I follow vain's, man's vain imagination, then I'm going to be in a position of weakness. A position of weakness. Look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Let's begin reading in verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth it not, and it shall be given. He goes, hey, ask me. I'll give you wisdom. I love that. But... Let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea. Let him ask in faith nothing wavering. He's like the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. Here it is, verse 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Who's for God? Who's for Baal? Silence. But that put them in a position of weakness. The Word of God says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Don't think that man can get anything from the Lord. He's like a wave of the sea, just tossed by every wind of doctrine. We read that in the Ephesians. That's the reason you have preachers and teachers and these things. So that they can train and preach and teach and the church will not be uh, just a bunch of people thrown about by every slot and uh, cunning craftiness of man and We'll be solid, not weak. Israel was in a position of weakness because of their silence, because there was no allegiance to God, because they, they allowed the barriers, the things that would hold them back. Instead of pressing through, they gave in to the pressure of those around them and the teaching of the day and the imagination of vain thoughts. And here they are in a position of weakness. Now the, the one that they really were leaning toward, Baal, he didn't show up. Now where are they? What happens when all that we've believed and followed outside of the Word of God, it won't happen, but when it doesn't, what happens? Hopelessness and despair. Depression and discouragement. Why is there so, many, so much depression and stuff? We've been following, we've been taking, we've been limping along in a, in a position of weakness, following man's vain imagination. And James just calls it out here. No power. No answered prayers. God's not working, even though we try to make up things that says God is working. He's not working like this. Other than letting man to leave, leaving man to his own ways and he'll destroy himself. I'm sure they were speechless when their God didn't answer. They were speechless. I thought that was the one. I taught my kids about that. I can't imagine it. 
those, those Israelites who had Torah, the, God, the Word of God, and all of a sudden they started following this other thing and raised their children in it, and now he doesn't show up. They're speechless. Sad. And so we know what Elijah does. Verse 38, the fire of the Lord fell. And then what happens in verse 39? Then when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Wow. What is it going to take, though? You go, well, they were adults. They got through it. They could turn their life around. Yeah. What about their children that had been having the philosophy and indoctrination of Baal worship put into their minds? Put side by side so that they could choose. They can choose. What about them? The position of weakness, number two, is a position of danger. When I look around and I'm persuaded, and I don't know which way to go. This way or that way. Is it God? Is it Buddha? Joseph Smith? I don't know. I'm just going to do it all. I'm just going to have all those stickers on the back of my car. You know, that's funny to me. But I'm just going to do it. Just show I just love everybody. Well, you put yourself, first of all, in a position of weakness. And secondly, a position of danger. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Beginning in verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Talking about salvation. When we get saved, the Spirit comes in and makes us alive. Alive to what? Aren't we already? Now we're alive to God. Now we can have communion and fellowship with God. We're in, in times past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. You see all that? That's what the world's doing. Are we hot between that? The prince of the power of the air is putting in my, people's minds all kinds of vain imaginations, and we really, do we struggle with that? We do. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And listen to this. Among whom also we had all, had all, all had our conversation in time past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Here it is. And were by nature the children of wrath. Pretty dangerous position. If I'm a child of God, I was, I'll get severe discipline in this life. If I'm not a child of God then the wrath of God abides upon me. If, I do not, if I've not trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, listen guys, sin has separated us from God. And there's all kinds of ideas today. How can I get back to God? Well, just do your best. Just do your best. And then there's some that goes, well, when you die, you're dead. You're gone. You don't even know you're dead. You're just annihilated. You know, or just go to church every now and then. You get there. Or we might be one of those that look at the multitude and go, well, I'm as good as all of those. I'm as good. All those vain imaginations. That's not what saves us. If we go to verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 2, But God, who is rich in mercy for His great love, wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, He hath quickened us, Together with Christ, by grace you are saved. He's raised us up to sit together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Not of works. Vain imagination says, well, I've got to work my way to heaven. Biblical revelation says, salvation by grace through faith. What are we counting on in our salvation today? Why halt you between two opinions? Well, I think, I think, when are we going to step out and go, 
I need a savior. I've been trying to say I've been trying to save myself all these years, and I'm a, I don't want to come out because everybody thinks I'm saved. Fear of man, and I'm as good as anybody else. The multitudes. You're weak and in a dangerous position right now. Children of wrath, the wrath of God abides upon those who know not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And the only way for we, us to be saved is to know that I'm a sinner on the inside. My thoughts are wrong. My mind, the Bible says I'm enmity with God in our minds. So I can't think right. So the only way I can is come to the Bible and see how to think. And as I look in there, I go, grace means free. I can do nothing for it. Absolutely. Nothing you can do for salvation. Nothing. Just realize you're a sinner that without Christ, you'll spend an eternity in hell and you go to him and you cling to him until God comes. Until you know that you're a savior. You know that he saved you. We've gotten away from this. This quick coming forward, praying stuff, and everybody's saved, and they'll never come back to church again. Whoa. We're limping. When the Lord Jesus comes into our life and changes our man, we be, all th- old things are passed away, and behold, old things become new. There's a change. There's a new desire. As, the, as, as newborn's babe desires a sincere miracle of the Word. But you never see him again. And then you see him 10 years from now. Oh, yeah, I got saved over there. I can't be a judge of people's salvation, but friend, if I didn't have a hunger for the things of God, I'd be concerned. It's a position of danger. God could judge, God could take any one of us today, and however it is between us and Christ, if I've ever re- put my faith in Christ, work on the cross to pay for my sins, or if I didn't, it will show. In eternity. Do we want to play with that game? Do we want to be like Israel and be limping between two, two opinions? Well, some say works and some say it's grace. And I'm just going to do both of them. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to say I get saved, but at the same time I'm going to do a lot of good things. <laughs> you get saved, you'll do good things. Because it's the fruit that we produce because we're a new creature. It's not we get, do good things and get saved. How long haunt you between two opinions this morning? If you're not saved today, today's the day of salvation. If you are saved today, then I'm like Elijah. If God's God, follow him. If man's imagination, thoughts, or Balaam, Bill, follow him. Follow him. But we both know, I mean, excuse me, all of us know who's God. It's written on our hearts. We know. Even though people might sit here and go, you know, I don't think there is a God. You're, you know, that's not true. You know there's one. You've just pushed it down for so long that you convinced yourself. But, but at a time, you knew there was one. Everybody does. Don't lose that. Let's get back to God today. Let's not be silent and let our allegiance to who God is, we're a, our allegiance is to Him. And let's live it. And let's influence those people around us that listen to us. Let's put God thoughts in their mind. And when they bring up something that's wicked imaginations of the world, we go, no, that is not what God says. But we're afraid of that. Some, many, many are. I, well, I'll lose my family. I, I'll lose this. I'll lose that. Well, if you can't do that to your family, you already lost them. You already have. If we be truthful, there's a chance for them to come back. Truth brings back, not lies. Lies destroy. Truth brings life. Let's keep that in our mind. So, friend, this morning, where are you? What's your position? Is your position a, a position of weakness and danger or a position of strength and power? Because we know the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And we're not silent about it.
We recognize the barriers. They're there. But they don't stop us. Let's bow our heads. With his bowed and eyes closed this morning, I want to ask you something. If you were to die today, do you know you'd go to heaven? If you were to die today, do you know that you would go to heaven? Is anybody here to say, Preacher, I'm not sure that I would go to heaven. I don't know if I ever got saved. Somebody told me I did, and I said some kind of prayer, but I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I want to know that. Is there anyone here to say, Preacher, pray for me? I want to know that. Would you just slip up your hand right now? No one looking around. I just want to pray for you. Just slip up your hand. I recognize I was a sinner, and there was nothing I could do to change my sin nature. I could do good behavior, but my heart was bad. I needed a change on the inside. I hope that you've had that. Christian, after we get saved, who's God in your life? If God's God, then follow Him. If man's God or man's vain imaginations are God, follow that. But quit limping. Quit limping. Between two opinions. Choose God today. Father, I thank you today for your word. Thank you for teaching us. God, thank you for just right in, right, right in, right up in, right up close and personal, you confronted us today with a question. And Lord, I pray that we'd answer that <laughs> the right way. Lord, I ask, I pray everyone here knows Jesus as Savior. And then, Lord, I pray we live not just ourselves, of course ourselves, but even in our circle of influences, Father, they will let people know who God, who you are, the God, He is Lord. God, help us to live for you and to follow you. Blessing this invitation, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's stand to our feet.